Welcome to today's Train Engineers Newsletter Live program. Today's program is part two of the decarbonization series. If you haven't viewed part one and decarbonization is a new topic to you, it'd be worth your time to check that one out. It's available on train.com under self-paced learning. In that ENL, we covered a lot of the basics behind decarbonization or electrification. Some of the topics we hit on were general terms, some of the why behind the trend, where policy is currently impacting customers, and started to touch on potential product solutions for electrification of heat. In today's ENL, we're going to take a deeper look at electrification and the products and systems that are being applied. To help shape the conversation today, and to provide more context for a wide viewing audience, we're going to look at three different HVAC applications, a small, medium, and large example, and discuss the heating water temperature impact. To cover this topic today, we have train application engineers Charlie Jellen, Dan Gentry, and Emma Van Fossen from our Train Accelerated Development Program. Charlie will get us started. Thank you. As Jeannie mentioned, we're going to use three different HVAC applications in three different locations. We'll be looking at a small office or retail application, a medium-sized middle or high school, and a large hospital application. The three cities we picked to model these applications in are Seattle, St. Louis, and Boston. We'll start by reviewing E-Grid values for our three locations. The E-Grid is published by the United States Energy Information Administration and indicates the average CO2 equivalent emissions per megawatt hour of electricity consumed in various parts of the country. We see that Washington has the lowest electricity emissions of the three cities we're looking at, with an average of 299 pounds of CO2e per megawatt hour, followed by Boston with 781 pounds per megawatt hour, while St. Louis has significantly higher average at almost 1,600 pounds per megawatt hour. What this means is that not every megawatt hour of electricity is created equally. Utility grids that have higher percentages of renewable generation mixed with low percentages of coal generation will have lower electric emission rates. This map also provides a heat map for every state. The lighter the state, the cleaner the grid. Now we also want to compare the emissions incurred from the current grid with the projected emissions for the future grid. We'll use these future values in our examples to show how the building emission profile can improve over time. We can use state and utility publications to estimate what these grids will be like in the future. Washington and Massachusetts both have renewable portfolio standards, RPSs mandating that their utilities supply a certain percentage of carbon-free energy by the year 2030. Amarin is the primary electric utility in St. Louis, and they have set a goal of having 50% carbon-free energy by 2030 in its integrated resource plan. With these values, we can estimate average CO2e emissions per energy consumption in the year 2030. Next, we need to talk about baseline energy consumption data for our examples. We use data from the US Energy Information Administration to compile an energy consumption profile for these buildings. Based on building location and activity, we will assume that each building has the electricity and natural gas energy intensities shown here. You can think of these as average buildings in operation today. All right. Making her Engineers Newsletter Live debut, and to kick off our examples, Emma is going to take us through a small office application. Thanks, Charlie. Let's begin with our small building application example, a 20,000 square foot office. We will highlight the three different cities that Charlie introduced to demonstrate how geography and climate affects application. As Charlie explained, we used EIA data to estimate the following electricity and natural gas annual consumption amounts for the three locations. Seattle has the lowest consumption for both electricity and natural gas, not surprising as it has the mildest climate. St. Louis and Boston have similar loads, with Boston just a little higher in both electricity and gas consumption. We will start by calculating the current emissions of the building. 
For natural gas, we simply convert the heating BTUs into carbon emission equivalent based on average natural gas combustion products. Since this is a direct conversion, the emissions mirror the trend in natural gas consumption. For electricity emissions, we use the appropriate egrid factor. Since each location has a different grid with a different generation fuel mix, there are more factors at play in electricity emissions than the electricity consumption alone. For example, although the buildings in St. Louis and Boston had similar electricity consumption amounts, the electricity emissions in St. Louis are much higher because the Missouri grid is more emissions intensive or dirtier. So how can we decarbonize the HVAC systems in these buildings? I'll give a brief overview of two of the most popular products for small applications such as this one, and then we will use one system for a more in-depth analysis of electrified emissions. First, let's take a look at variable refrigerant flow, VRF systems. These systems can be paired with a dedicated outdoor air system, DOAS, or Energy Recovery Ventilator, ERV, for ventilation. This system has the advantage of cold climate capability as it continues to heat the space while the unit is undergoing defrost, all the way down to negative 22 degrees Fahrenheit. So a standard VRF system would be sufficient for each location we are considering. There is also the option of electric auxiliary fuel for even colder climates. VRF is an excellent candidate for new construction and retrofit in cases where there is no existing air conditioning as the cost of installing refrigerant lines is typically lower than ductwork. It's also favored for some applications for the flexibility offered by refrigerant line lengths. For more detailed information about VRF, DOAS, and ERV systems, you can check out our ENL Applying VRF for a Complete Building Solution. The second option I'm going to cover is a rooftop unit, or RTU heat pump. These systems are popular for smaller applications, especially for retrofitting existing RTUs since they have a similar footprint and accessibility. For the given application, we would choose an RTU heat pump whenever the building has an existing RTU. The downside is that RTU heat pumps typically do not have cold climate capability since their defrost mode consumes 100% of their heat output. Dan will go more in depth on defrost mode later on, but the key point here is that for the climates we are considering, especially St. Louis and Boston, we must include either dual or auxiliary fuel options. Note that with auxiliary fuel backup, the electrical service will likely need to be increased. An example RTU heat pump has listed COPs of 2.3 for low ambient heating operation, 3.6 for high ambient heating, and a dual fuel COP of 0.81, meaning a gas burner efficiency of 81%. Since applications of this type typically use RTUs, we will assume that we are retrofitting an existing gas electric RTU, so we will select the RTU heat pump for an in-depth analysis of decarbonized emissions. Since we've selected an RTU heat pump for this application, let's go a little more in depth on how RTU heat pumps operate. Most RTU heat pumps use staged compressors, meaning that the heater is cycled on and off to maintain the set point temperature, that is, raise the return air temperature back into the dead band, and the fan accordingly cycles between maximum and minimum speed only. This is in contrast to a modulating system, where the heater can be modulated to maintain a supply air temperature while the fan speed decreases. Some RTU heat pumps also have multiple stages, offering more efficient operation in the first stage while extending the heating capability when needed with the second stage. Now let's move on to calculating emissions from this heat pump option. The first step in estimating emissions for an RTU heat pump is understanding what operating mode the heat pump is in throughout the year. We will use this example annual temperature profile for St. Louis to discuss our operating ranges. This profile shows the hourly average dry bulb temperature in St. Louis, averaged over the past three years. We will assume that at any temperature less than 55 degrees Fahrenheit, the heat pump will be operating in heating mode. However, not all heating operation is the same. We can break this down further to get a more accurate estimate of energy consumption and emissions. The largest differentiation is standard operation versus cold climate operation. We will consider any temperature less than 15 Fahrenheit 
to be cold climate conditions and assume that the heat pump will be operating in either dual or auxiliary fuel mode, depending on which backup option is selected. We can also break down standard operation further for an even more accurate estimate. Most RTU heat pump manufacturers provide both low ambient and high ambient COPs. We can utilize both of these for a better estimate by analyzing how much, time, how much operating time is spent in each range. We will classify 15 to 35 Fahrenheit as a low ambient operation. For the time spent operating in this range, we will use the manufacturer's low ambient COP. Finally, the remaining operating time spent between 35 to 55 Fahrenheit will be considered high ambient operation and can use the manufacturer's high ambient COP. Note that the low ambient and high ambient rating conditions are not centered in these ranges, and this is by no means the only way to consider climate in calculating heat pump efficiency. This is a fairly quick approximation that yields more climate-informed estimates than using a single COP value. Here we see the breakdown of operating time spent in each range for the three locations. With this information, we can represent the annual heating energy consumption as a weighted sum of the energy consumption from each mode of operation. Let's illustrate this calculation using a dual fuel backup heat pump in St. Louis as an example. We can estimate the heating load from the historical natural gas consumption for the building and the efficiency of the existing gas electric RTUs. We'll assume 80% efficiency for this example. For a small office building, we can assume that all of the building's natural gas consumption is used for space heating. To find the energy consumption for any operating range, the annual heating load is multiplied by the percentage of heating operation time spent in that range and then divided by the appropriate COP. Keep in mind that auxiliary operation uses electric resistance heating, so the efficiency of auxiliary operation is always one. These operating range components are summed to find the total annual heating energy consumption. To calculate the emissions associated with each scenario, we follow the same process explained previously. Natural gas consumption is converted directly into CO2E emissions per unit of natural gas, while electricity consumption is multiplied by the appropriate E-grid factor. First, let's take a look at the trends in Seattle. There are several interesting things to point out here. First, we notice that the emissions in the 2030 fully electrified scenario, represented by the bar on the far right, or lack thereof, are zero. This is because, as Charlie explained earlier, Washington State has a renewable portfolio standard of carbon neutral electricity by 2030. So we're assuming that Seattle electricity will have zero associated emissions in 2030. The second interesting thing to note here is that there are no natural gas emissions in the dual fuel scenario. Recall that Seattle had no operating time with an ambient temperature below 15 Fahrenheit, so we don't have any cold climate operation in this location. This means that the two electrified scenarios have the same present day emissions. We also notice that electricity emissions increase in our electrified scenarios, which we expect because we're adding the heating load to our electricity consumption. But total building emissions decrease by almost one third overall. Next, let's look at the building in St. Louis. Immediately, we notice the impact of Missouri, Missouri's dirtier electrical grid and the scale of these emissions compared to those from the building in Seattle. In this region, we do have some cold climate operation, so in the dual fuel scenario, we see about one metric ton of CO2e emissions associated with natural gas. But this is obviously very much reduced from the non-electrified baseline of 36 metric tons. In fact, the natural gas consumption from the dual fuel backup is typically so minimal that it's often favored over auxiliary fuel backup to avoid upsizing the electrical service. One of the most striking pieces of information from this graph is that present day emissions actually increase slightly with electrification. Missouri's electrical utilities utilize coal so heavily that on average, Electricity in Missouri is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than an equivalent heating value of natural gas. 
However, we do see that as the electrical grid itself decarbonizes in accordance with the utilities resource plan for 2030, electrification of heating does lower emissions by about one third from the present day non-electrified baseline. Finally, we have our building in Boston. We can see from the scale of electricity emissions here that Massachusetts electrical grid is cleaner than Missouri's, but not as clean as Washington's. Although Massachusetts electrical grid is green enough that electrification reduces present day emissions, we see that the auxiliary fuel scenario has slightly higher emissions than the dual fuel scenario. Remember, part of the emissions reduction from electrification is due to the higher efficiency of heat pumps compared to traditional gas heating. Auxiliary fuel operation uses electric resistance heating, which is not as efficient as standard heat pump operation. Essentially, what we're seeing is that Massachusetts current grid is green enough to lower emissions only when paired with an efficiency bump from a heat pump. For this size of application, we typically aren't too concerned about the impacts of temperature set point. But for larger and more complicated decarbonized retrofits, this is an important consideration. Charlie will talk through this topic before we move on to medium and large application examples. For our next two examples, we'll be looking at hydronic applied systems. As Emma just mentioned, a couple, a critical component to these systems is the hot water temperature design point, not only for efficiency, but for heat pump capability. Over time, we've seen a general trend in comfort heating going to lower hot water set points. Common design set points from decades past would be to use 160 to 180 degree hot water set point. But with the advent of condensing boilers, along with coil heat transfer technology, we can achieve higher efficiencies with lower hot water temperatures. The result has been designers using hot water designs in the 110 to 140 degree range. And with more designers looking to heat pumps for electrification, this trend will likely continue and potentially accelerate. First, let's talk about capability and focus in on air source heat pumps to start. This is a generic operating map for a scroll compressor based air source heat pump. The solid red line depicts standard compressor operation. You can see the maximum hot water temperature is 140 degrees, but the ambient temperature minimum to be able to provide 140 degree hot water is around 45 degrees. For most cities, 45 degrees is greater than the design ambient minimum. So this solution without a backup typically won't work. What we're showing here in the dotted red line is operation using advanced compressor technology. This allows higher hot water temperature production at lower ambient temperatures. But regardless of which compressor technology you use, this type of equipment is typically limited to 140 degree hot water temperature. On top of that, the minimum ambient operation for air to water equipment is commonly limited to zero degrees. Designers need to keep these minimums in mind to, and provide backup heat where appropriate. Next, let's look at water source equipment capability, typically referred to as chiller heaters when used in heating applications. Here is a generic operating map for a screw compressor based chiller heater. The solid red line shows standard equipment operation. The maximum hot water set point, regardless of the evaporator temperature, is around 140 to 150 degrees. The dotted red line shows an expanded operating map for equipment that has been optimized for heating. The maximum hot water set point for this type of equipment is around 180 degrees. With 180 degree hot water production, this equipment could cover the majority of heating applications, including many retrofits. There is, however, one thing to consider. At 180 degrees, the minimum evaporator leaving temperature is about 60 degrees, and that is a fairly high chilled water temperature and may not be suitable for most systems. This setup does, however, lend itself well for a cascaded solution if the highest hot water temperatures are required. And we'll take a look at an application like that in a little bit. The temperature requirement for a system is heavily dependent on the air side coils in that system. If a project is looking to pursue electrification in a retrofit and the air side is not going to be replaced, the designer has limited ability to modify the hot water temperature set point. 
However, in new construction or major renovation of the HVAC system, the designer has the ability to optimize the hot water temperature. Which brings up our last topic for this section, the impact on capacity and efficiency in relation to hot water temperature. Just because a piece of equipment can operate at a given high temperature set point doesn't mean that's the best place for that equipment or the system to operate. First, we'll look at both heating and cooling capacity as hot water set point increases. For this analysis, we held the evaporator leaving temperature constant. The equipment in this example is a screw compressor based chiller heater, but this general trend will hold true for other compressors as well. Going from a hot water set point of 95 degrees to a set point of 135 degrees, the heating capacity decreases by 15% and the cooling capacity by 27%. Generally speaking, these percents translate to dollars, meaning the extra 40 degrees of hot water set point would cost the owner between 15 and 30% more depending on how the chiller heater is being used in that system. One thing to note here, you can see the cooling capacity drops faster than the heating capacity. This is because the compressor becomes more inefficient at higher hot water set points. This advantages the heating operation because those inefficiencies are rejected as more heat to the hot water stream. Next, let's look at the impact to efficiency. We'll use that same screw compressor chiller heater from the last example. For both cooling and heating COP, the efficiency drops as the hot water set point increases. From 95F to 135F, the cooling COP drops by 47% and the, C and the heating COP drops by 38%, which is roughly 1% of efficiency drop per degree of hot water increase. And this is a massive drop in performance and a large opportunity for system designers to save energy. Now this chart is only showing the cooling and heating production equipment. Temperature set point also has an impact on air handling units, terminal products, and pump performance and cost. So let's briefly look at those trade-offs. As the hot water set point decreases, both air handling units and terminal equipment need to be designed with different coils to maintain adequate discharge air temperatures. This typically means larger coils with either more rows or more fins per inch. Shown here, you can see with 180 degree hot water, the designer could use a one row coil to get an 85 degree discharge air temperature. With 130 degree hot water, we needed a four row coil to get to the same 85 degree discharge. But with manufacturers having a wide variety of coil options, an increase in coil static pressure can be mitigated. What that means is the impact to the fan system and the corresponding energy draw has the ability to stay fairly constant. However, that typically means you'll have coils with more rows, which will increase the cost of the coil. On the pumping side, as the hot water temperature decreases, so too does the system delta T. The lower the delta T, the more water we need to pump in order to condition the same BTUs in the space. All right, let's, let's pull this all together. For energy performance, as you move to lower hot water temperatures, you'll see an increase in heating equipment performance, but a decrease in pump performance. For cost, as you move to lower hot water temperatures, you'll see a decrease in heating equipment cost, but an increase in coil, pump, and pipe costs. Now, generally speaking, lower hot water temperatures will provide a more efficient system with neutral to higher upfront costs. Okay, next up, Dan is going to walk us through our mid-sized application example. Great information, Charlie. Our next building application that will be evaluated in the three climate zones will be a medium-sized building. We will assume a 75,000 square foot single story school of average construction for this example. For the HVAC system and design, we will make the following assumptions for the base model. The heating and cooling systems are hydronic hot and chilled water with VAV air side distribution. 
The heat source is an 80% efficient natural gas boiler. The cooling source is an electric air-cooled chiller rated at minimum code compliance. As both Charlie and Emma have earlier discussed, we'll use the same map and CBEX data to illustrate the energy consumption profile for our medium building example in the three different climates. In doing so, we arrive at the values shown here. Using the same methodology as Emma previously described, but applied to our medium-sized school, we can determine the total CO2e in metric tons that the example building would produce in each climate zone with our base heating and cooling system. Adding natural gas and electricity emissions, the building in Seattle is responsible for 360 metric tons of CO2e emissions annually. The building in St. Louis is responsible for 719 metric tons, and the building in Boston is responsible for 338 metric tons. Before we get into electrifying our building, we first need to consider a few design aspects. Because the chiller in our building is already electric, we will focus on products that provide heating only or simultaneous heating and cooling. Let's look at some factors to evaluate that will influence the choice of the electrified solution. The first design factor to consider is the source of heat, meaning is this an air source product or a water source product? There are major design and application implications to evaluate for each source type. If using air source equipment, then we must understand the ambient weather conditions of the location. This is important to understand for air source heat pumps as the quantity of heat and hot water temperatures available degrade as the ambient decreases. More to come on this topic. Also when applying air source products, we may have to consider the defrost cycle and we will look at that coming up as well. If the ideal source is water, then we need to consider the available temperatures of that fluid to determine if the unit can perform as intended. A typical question may be something like, can my heat pump produce 130 degree hot water when the incoming source temperature is 38 degrees? Common sources may include, but not be limited to, a cooling load with heat recovery, geothermal or ground source, groundwater or bodies of water, solar, and exhaust air. Our last aspect is examining the existing system design if it will be reused. Is the water distribution a two-pipe changeover system or four-pipe? The distribution system helps define the type of equipment that can be utilized for the electrified solution. As we, as we further explore this topic, air source systems will be a large part of the products evaluated. Most air source heat pump designs will allow for up to 140 degree hot water. However, as Charlie earlier described, the amount of heat and hot water temperature available decrease as the ambient decreases. For example, in order to deliver 140 degree hot water, the ambient needs to be a around 45 degrees. The graph shown here reflects the relationship between ambient temperature and hot water temperature available for a typical air source heat pump. With 45 degrees being well above most design heating ambient temperatures, this gives us a couple of system design items to consider. Do we design around a lower hot water temperature or consider a second heating source, or maybe both? Many new construction comfort heating designs are below 120 degrees, which we know offers greater COP, lower upfront equipment costs, and does not work the equipment near its limits. If our design heating ambient was 20 degrees, we could get around 120 degree hot water out of a typical heat pump. 120 degrees offers higher capacity and a higher COP compared to 140 degrees. If we look at the lower end of the ambient limitations of the heat pump, we would often see most models ability to produce 100 degrees hot water at zero degrees. If higher temperatures are still required, a backup or auxiliary boiler can always be considered similar to what is shown in the diagram. Recently, there have been some new advancements in scroll compressor technology that allow for expanded operating maps. 
This means heat pumps will be able to produce warmer water at colder ambient temperatures compared to existing designs. These units are capable of producing up to 130 degree hot water down to zero degrees. This is exciting news for colder climates looking for more electrified heating solutions. We have seen how ambient temperature affects the available hot water temperature out of a heat pump. Now we will look at how ambient affects the capacity of the heat pumps. This graph illustrates the relationship between ambient and capacity. As the ambient rises, the available capacity out of the heat pump increases, and as the ambient decreases, the capacity available decreases. Because we are discussing air source heat pumps, we must think through defrost mode and how it affects the hot water distribution. Defrost has to occur in cold climates when heat pumps are operating in heating mode because the air coil is acting as an evaporator or heat source. And when it's cold enough outside, the coil will begin to build ice. In order to maintain performance and prevent damage to the unit, the refrigeration circuit must change into cooling mode or divert the compressor discharge gas to the air coil instead of the load heat exchanger in order to melt the ice that has built up. So what can be done to mitigate the effects of defrost? Unit sizing could be used to reduce the impact of defrost mode. Most air source heat pumps are multi-circuit by design. If you oversize the heat pump by 50%, then whenever one circuit is in defrost, you still have almost full capacity available. The downside, of course, is added equipment cost and space but it is an option to address defrost. One can also consider the quantity of circuits in a given package. Let's compare a potential 140-ton packaged heat pump system with two units and a 140-ton modular heat pump consisting of seven 20-ton modules. The packaged heat pump will have two circuits, and only one circuit can go into defrost at a given time. So around 75% capacity would be available in heating defrost mode. If we look at the modular option, with only one module going into defrost at a time, that bank would still have about 86% heating capacity available. Maybe this is okay for the design and maybe not. Additional heat pumps or modules could be considered to offset this defrost mode. Air source heat pumps also have time delays built into the defrost mode. Typically, most unit controls will have maximum time in defrost mode, minimum time between defrost cycles, limits on number of circuits in defrost, or even advanced intelligent defrost. The idea here is to try and limit the amount of circuits in defrost at a given time and reduce the time they spend in defrost mode in order to provide maximum heating capacity when most needed. Lastly, as mentioned earlier, a backup heating source can be considered. A boiler would be present in most existing heating systems, so this could be used as a backup source if the heat pump cannot handle the load. Or in a new electrified system, an electric boiler could be installed to keep the carbon footprint low. After the previous considerations have been evaluated, we can look at potential electrified product solutions. Here's a look at the upcoming product solutions that we will discuss for the electrification of our example school. Our first electrified heating product is a two-pipe air source heat pump, or ASHP. One would consider this product choice in a two-pipe changeover system. These products are commonly designed using scroll compressors and are available in packaged and modular platforms. What makes these units unique is the addition of a four-way refrigerant reversing valve in each refrigeration circuit. The position of this valve, dictated by the unit controls, determines which mode, either heating or cooling, that the unit is operating in. These units operate in either heating or cooling. There is no simultaneous recovery. The next potential product solution is an air-cooled chiller with full or partial heat recovery capabilities. Similar to the previous units, these products feature scroll compressors and are available in packaged and modular platforms. This machine can operate in cooling only mode or heat recovery mode 
but not heating only mode. These machines would be well suited in a moderate climate where the building heating load never exceeds the cooling load. Think of a school in a mild climate that always needs cooling but also has a reasonable heating load. The chiller is capable of operating in heat recovery mode to satisfy the smaller heating load while also fulfilling the cooling dominant needs. This would be like packing a water to water heat recovery chiller into an air cooled package chiller. A big benefit here is the heating and cooling equipment is all packaged together and outside. A potential water source electrified solution could be a six pipe heat pump. This unique design has three separate loops, one for heating, one for cooling, and one for the geothermal loop. This design allows for water in the heating and cooling loops and glycol in the geothermal loop with no mixing of the fluids. Glycol in the geo loop is common in many geothermal applications and it is commonly preferable to have water in the building heating and cooling loops to maintain efficiency and reduce maintenance. These units are capable of operating in heating, cooling, and heat recovery modes. This image demonstrates how the unit could be operating in cooling dominant mode while still providing some recovered heat. Conversely, the unit is also capable of heating dominant operation while still providing some cooling. This single piece of equipment could provide the total building heating and cooling needs. In addition to the previous applied solutions, RTU heat pumps and VRF with DOAS are viable options for schools as well, and these would be the same solutions that Emma covered earlier. Our last equipment solution and the product we will evaluate for electrification is an air source heat pump with heat recovery. These units offer a high level of flexibility and function. Each unit can operate in one of three modes. Cooling mode, just like a typical air-cooled chiller. With a shift of the internal valves, the unit can operate in heating mode. And with another change in the internal valves positioning, the unit operates in heat recovery mode. With multiple units and centralized controls, load matching is simple and convenient in varying conditions. These units come in both packaged and modular configurations. Most units are capable of up to 140 degree hot water and can operate down to zero degrees with reduced leaving hot water temperatures. Since the unit can operate in heating, cooling, and heat recovery mode, a single piece of equipment can be used to replace the existing chiller boiler system. This greatly simplifies electrifying a building. Of course the boiler can be left in place for backup as needed. In order to evaluate the carbon reduction due to electrification, we need to establish some performance criteria for our example. For this exercise, we are going to express the efficiency in terms of COP and use an average value. To determine the COP, we will assume a weighted average for the typical heating daytime temperature and design heating ambient temperature. When we weigh these temperatures, we arrive at the ambient temperatures shown to base our heat pump selections on. We will also use 120 degree hot water for the selection. If we select a typical air source heat pump at the ambient temperatures shown for each climate zone, we get the COPs shown which we can use for our carbon reduction example. To summarize our findings, we will review graphs similar to Emma's evaluation, but with only three grid categories, non-electrified current grid, electrified current grid, and 2030 electrified grid, with each location using its appropriate E-grid values. Each bar represents the building CO2E emissions in metric tons. First, we'll look at Seattle. The first thing we notice is the lack of emissions in the 2030 electrified grid. As we earlier discussed, this is due to Washington State's commitment to carbon neutral electricity by 2030. The second item we notice is that simply going from gas and electric to all electric with heat pumps is a 40% reduction in carbon emissions, which is quite a large reduction. Currently, this building would use quite a bit of gas for heating and changing that source from gas to a higher COP heat pump significantly reduces the consumption on an already cleaner grid. Next we have our school in St. Louis. 
The first trend we notice is that electrification on the current grid actually increases the carbon emissions by about 9%. We saw the same occurrence happen in the small building example, but to a lesser degree. As earlier described, this is largely due to Missouri's high mix of coal use for electricity production in conjunction with the typical heating ambient being about 12 degrees colder than Seattle, which we know negatively impacts the COP of the heat pump. To counteract this, we could consider either lowering heating supply temperatures or select a more efficient heat pump. For example, if the COP of our heat pump was 3 instead of the 2.3 used for this example, the current electrified grid would have equal emissions to the non-electrified grid, or simply stated, no change in carbon emissions. As we now know, St. Louis does have cleaner grid ambitions for the future, and we see the impact that this will have on our 2030 electrified scenario. Here, we see a reduction in CO2e emissions by about 32% with our electrified heat pump system. Last is our school in Boston. Here we see the impact of Boston's cleaner current grid compared to the previous grid, and recall that heating ambient temperatures and heat pump COPs are about the same for Boston and St. Louis. When we electrify our building today, we notice carbon emissions reduced by about 14% from our base non-electrified grid. Looking to the 2030 grid, we see emissions reduced by about 32% compared to the base. Overall, this nicely illustrates Boston's cleaner grid today and into the future. For our last example, we're going to look at a larger healthcare facility. Using the regional averages for a 500,000 square foot campus, we came up with the following energy results. In doing so, we arrive at the value shown here. Converting the natural gas consumption to CO2 equivalents and applying the regional emission factors for electricity, you can see the total emissions for the different locations on the slide. For the larger building example, we're going to focus in on a district style chilled and hot water plant and how that plant might morph over time to capitalize on decarbonization. We'll start with the load profile for the entire campus. This profile was created by Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, PNNL, for a healthcare facility. On the chart, we're calling out three different types of load, cooling only, heating only, and simultaneous cooling and heating loads. In the past, a system like this would be served by a chiller and a boiler, each asset dedicated to its respective load. One of the first steps designers are taking when starting down the path of electrification is heat recovery. Let's start with our plant load profile and focus in on the summer months when the plant is cooling dominant. You can see here that the cooling load is always larger than the heating load. What that means is we can take full advantage of heat recovery from the cooling load to meet the heating requirements. Now back to our layout with chillers and boilers. In our business as usual case, we'd have two or three of these chillers in operation during the summer meeting those cooling loads and we'd have one boiler at part load meeting the heating loads. Whenever a chiller is in operation, the condenser system is rejecting heat through a cooling tower. At first glance, this seems like the obvious place to recover heat. However, the condenser circuit is typically designed for water temperatures of 100 degrees and below and would require a secondary heat exchanger to isolate the open condenser circuit. On top of that, if the project is, is a retrofit, you'll likely be looking to add dedicated equipment to handle the heat recovery instead of modifying existing circuits. Shown here is a potential way to pipe in a dedicated heat recovery machine. This setup is commonly called side stream and could be one or multiple machines. It takes the return water from both the heating and the cooling loads and returns that water directly back to the return. This setup allows the heat recovery machine to control to either a leaving evaporator temperature, a leaving condenser temperature, or both if variable flow is allowed. The advantage of this setup is that control flexibility of the heat recovery machine. Side stream control easily allows the machine to reliably operate within its capabilities. It also allows the heat recovery machine to match either the heating or the cooling load demands. 
The downside of this setup is the reduced delta T that the main cooling and heating plants will see. As a quick example, let's say your heating plant produces 130 degree hot water and your loads return a hot water temperature of 110 degrees. If the heat recovery machine is controlling to 130 degrees and it's roughly doing half of the current heating capacity, the main heating plant would see 120 degrees. If heat recovery operation is happening near design conditions, the designer would need to take this into account, which will typically result in slightly larger primary pumps and primary piping. Alternatively, either the cooling or the heating side of the heat recovery machine could be piped in a preferentially loaded position. Shown here is the cooling side preferentially loaded. The requirement with this setup is that the heat recovery machine produce the required distribution temperature set point. There is no way to trim this temperature before it is sent to the cooling loads. The advantage is this machine does not lower the design delta T to the main cooling plant and therefore will not impact pump and pipe sizing of the primary equipment. Next we want to talk about sizing these heat recovery machines. This is a critical step because oversizing heat recovery machines can put the equipment in a situation where it has to cycle frequently to meet the load. On top of that, if you oversize the equipment, it's just a waste of money. Now on the other hand, undersizing the equipment limits the potential efficiency of the plant. So the best path to sizing heat recovery is with a load profile that the design team feels comfortable with. Here is our load profile for this example hospital building. It can be hard to tell where the peak simultaneous load is on a graph like this. But if we take the same data and sort by descending cooling load, then overlay the heating loads, we can clearly find where the peak heat recovery potential is. In our example, the peak heat recovery load is about 85% lower than the peak cooling and about 75% lower than the peak heating. These percentages are far below what we've seen for rule of thumb design points. What we would recommend for this load profile is a heat recovery machine that can produce 25% of the peak heating load or slightly less to avoid oversizing. Okay, let's move from summer cooling and heating into fall and spring, commonly called shoulder seasons. You can see here that we now have a mix of cooling dominant, heating dominant, and fairly even loads. In cooling dominant, the operation is no different than during the summer months that we just discussed only now you'll have less trimming required by the main plant. If the loads are relatively even and less than the capacity of the heat recovery machine, you can do all of your cooling and heating with that heat recovery machine. The issue we need to explore is what happens when the energy plant sees higher heating loads than cooling loads or higher heating loads than the capacity of the heat recovery machine. We'll start with the required loads for a snapshot in time during the shoulder months. We'll assume the building requires 3,000 kBTUs of cooling energy and 6,000 kBTUs of heating energy. At this point in time, the heat recovery machine has the capability to handle the entire cooling load, so it offsets that entire 3,000 kBTUs. On the heating side of the heat recovery machine, you see a larger energy value than cooling. This is because the machine adds the heat of compression to the heating stream. However, this 3600 kBTUs is not enough to offset the entire heating load. In most cases, the remainder of the heating load would be offset by the boiler plant. One question we get asked about with heat recovery machines is why we want control to the heating demand in this situation. The problem becomes is what would happen on the cooling side. If we controlled to that heating demand, we'd have excess cooling capacity. This would likely drive the leaving evaporator temperature down to a cutoff and require the, mach the machine to cycle offline, which would then provide no heating from the heat recovery machine. In the scenario we just walked through, we are still using natural gas for a substantial amount of heating. So let's take a look at a few design ideas for facilities to look at to further electrify or even go all electric. The primary area we'll focus on is the winter heating months and heating dominant shoulder seasons. The hurdle to overcome is where do we source heating energy after tapping out of cooling load heat recovery. 
we're going to look at three categories to accomplish this. Electric resistance boilers, air source heat pumps, and water source heat pumps. First is electric resistance boilers. In terms of operation, this would be the most straightforward way to electrify this plant. Electric boilers can handle the existing temperature and capacity requirements of most natural gas boilers, and they fit within the same general footprint and indoor operation as the existing equipment. The downside of going with electric resistance is twofold. First is the electrical feed required to support an electric resistance boiler of this size would be very large and likely require new distribution from the main transformer. Secondly is the operational cost associated with an electric resistance boiler. These machines have a COP of about one or slightly lower. This is generally in the same ballpark as a high efficiency natural gas boiler. But the cost of electricity is typically much higher than the cost of natural gas. So the operational cost with electric resistance boilers would increase. The next technology we'll look at is air source heat pumps. In the K-12 example, Dan walked through air source technology in detail, so I'm not going to do that here. But what I will show you is a potential way to bring a heat pump into operation. What I'm showing you here is a two-pipe air source heat pump working with a heat recovery machine. But depending on the size of the heat recovery load versus the heating load, these two machines could be combined into one package which would be called a four-pipe air source heat pump with heat recovery. But in this example, we're going to keep them separate. The heat recovery machine would be the first one to recover as much heat as possible from the cooling load. When the heating load exceeds the heat recovery contribution, the heat pump would be enabled to meet the rest of the load. Dan walked through some of the limitations of air source equipment in heating mode. The two that I want to bring up here are ambient limits and hot water temperature limits. On the ambient side, if the outside air gets much below zero, this equipment shuts down, which puts the balance of the heating load in our example back on the boiler plant. For the temperature limit, many existing hot water systems are designed for temperatures higher than the max hot water temperature set point for air source heat pumps, which is about 140 degrees. To get to higher temperatures with air source equipment, one potential option is to cascade a water-to-water -water unit into the system. What we're showing you here is an air source heat pump that pulls BTUs from the ambient and maintains a lower temperature hot water loop. A water-to-water -water heater further boosts that hot water temperature up to the required system design set point. Also worth noting, is that air source heat pumps are typically reversible, so they could be piped into the cooling system to provide excess cooling capacity as well. The final category we'll look at is water source heat pumps. With this equipment, we'll be looking to find BTUs outside of heat recovery from a cooling load and ambient air. The three sources we'll look at are geothermal, waste energy, and thermal storage. We'll start with geothermal, which has been around for many years. Advantages include potential for high efficiency systems because they're relatively mild and consistent ground temperatures, as well as the ability to shift your heating loads from gas to electricity. The downside of geothermal is the space required to drill the boreholes and the cost associated with it. Back to our example, if we wanted to add a geothermal component to our energy plant, one possibility would be to tie in the heat recovery machines. This would allow the heat recovery machines to match the heating, the cooling, and the heat recovery loads at all time during the year up to the maximum machine loads. The next category we'll look at is using a waste stream to pull BTUs from to provide useful heat to the building. The two sources we'll look at are gray water and building exhaust. Gray water systems use a specialized heat exchanger that allow the system to safely pull BTUs from a waste stream. And there are two general approaches for this type of system. One uses only the building's gray water, and the other uses a municipal or shared sewer stream. Regardless of the approach, the end result is the same, which is a near constant source of heating energy year round. Tying this type of system into our existing energy plant could look like this. 
we'd use the building waste to load up the heat recovery machine and use the rejected heat to heat the building. This approach allows the building to get electrified heat when there is either no cooling load or when the ambient temps are at their lowest. A different iteration on this concept would be to use building exhaust air as a source of heat. Building exhaust can be cooled down before it's rejected to the ambient to load up a heat recovery machine for building heating. The last water source system we'll look at is thermal storage. This works by using a thermal energy tank, primarily ice tanks, as a source and a sink for heating and cooling. In the graphic here, the heat recovery machine makes cold enough solution to make ice in the tank. This allows the condenser to reject heat to offset the heating loads. As the building loads shift throughout the day from heating to cooling, we can use the stored ice to meet the cooling loads. If we have more cooling load than heating load throughout the day, the tanks will be completely liquid for the next morning's heating loads. If, however, the heating loads are greater than the cooling loads for that day, we might have leftover ice in the tanks. This would limit the heat that's available for the next morning. So to get around this, we would need another heating source to melt the remainder of the ice. This could be accomplished from solar thermal panels, air source heat pump equipment, or some type of waste recovery operation from the campus. Next, we'll look at our emission analysis for this healthcare facility. For this example, we're going to assume we were able to 100% electrify the heating and the cooling loads. We did this to show the potential impact to the campus, and we'll talk about the feasibility of that assumption, assumption shortly. Larger facilities typically have more opportunity to use heat pump and chiller heater technologies that can significantly increase heating COPs. Examples we shared earlier would be heat recovery and waste heat recovery operation. Because of this, we were able to see average heating COPs fall between 3.5 and 4.5 across the cities we analyzed. The trends from our previous examples that Emma and Dan walked through hold true for the healthcare facility as well. The overall reductions from non-electrified to current electrified are slightly larger because the healthcare facility has a higher heating percentage of overall energy compared to the other applications. An interesting point to look at is the absolute emission reductions for each of these cities. By 2030, this application in Seattle is looking to remove 4,000 metric tons of CO2e. In St. Louis, it's looking at the same 4,000 metric tons of CO2e, while Boston is looking to reduce half of that by 2,000 metric tons. But because every city is starting from a different emission baseline, their 2030 values are all drastically different by location. But across the board, by 2030, electrification of this application reduces overall carbon emissions in all three cities. For our example of a hospital, we assumed we could electrify the entire campus. In actual practice, we know this would be extremely difficult. There are process and systems in both healthcare facilities and industry that require temperatures and capability that are greater than what current heat pump technology can provide. So the path to fully electrified systems will be longer for some applications than others. The last topic we want to cover today is on the financial impact of electrification and some of the mechanisms that are being applied to help justify these projects. First, we're going to look at incentives. There are many programs around the US and Canada focused on incentivizing customers to fuel switch. That means switching from burning natural gas for heating to using an electric source. On the commercial side, most of these programs require an analysis to show the amount of BTU saved by switching to electric sources. The amount of incentive varies by authority and application, but we have seen up to $200 per MMBTU available for customers to utilize. Next, we're going to look at penalties, the opposite of incentives. These take the form of carbon caps, like Local Law 97 in New York City, or carbon taxes, like what is in place in Canada. Customers need to take these penalties into account when analyzing the financials of a non-electrified solution. The last one here is carbon pricing, 
commonly called a shadow price. Some corporations are putting an internal price on carbon to help justify projects that have a, a, an emission-related goal. Typically, you'll see an internal carbon price along with a publicly stated emission reduction goal. Common carbon pricing is between $10 and $50 per metric ton of CO2e. Now, all three of these mechanisms have the same end goal, driving beneficial electrification and overall decarbonization into the built environment. So that is our DCARB program part two. We hope you enjoyed it and found it a helpful way to understand a few different application solutions. As always, the bibliography included in your handout provides more information on where to find a number of resources related to today's topic, including a heating with compressor application manual and links to part one of today's topic. Or contact your local train account manager for specific information on train systems, equipment, controls, and services. And for those of you seeking continuing education credit, check out the newest online courses at our new and improved self-paced learning portal. And fill out a survey to let us know what you thought of today's program. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next time.